Welcome to this new edition of Vienna Showcase from the Sigmund Freud Museum. With our Vienna Showcase, the Vienna Tourist Board has launched a live stream series in 2020 that invites visitors to take virtual tours of Vienna's latest highlights in art and culture. The current edition highlights the recently reopened Sigmund Freud Museum and the interplay between contemporary art and mental health. We are streaming today to inaugurate our participation of the Art Basel online viewing room, Miami Beach, and celebrate our long-standing partnership with Art Basel. In the next hour, you can look forward to a guided tour of the exquisitely renovated Sigmund Freud Museum in Vienna. Immediately afterwards, the tour will continue with a live panel discussion on art, analysis, and public health. So please join us now at the birthplace of psychoanalysis and Vienna's most famous address, Berggasse 19. Welcome at Berggasse 19 in the Sigmund Freud Museum in Vienna. We opened at the end of August after a major renovation and reorganization, and now I would like to take you on a tour. Please follow me. So here we are at the origin of psychoanalysis, where Freud lived for 47 years with his family, and arrived at the mezzanine, we can choose to enter on one side Freud's former private apartment or his practice. And we will ring the bell to step into Freud's private apartment now. So here we are in the entrance and wardrobe of Freud's apartment. And this showcase you can see here in the center of the wardrobe is dedicated to Freud's early years. And Freud started with his self-analysis and therefore we present here his autobiographical studies called in German Selbstdarstellung. So this is the introduction to Freud's person and life. The next room is the so-called Herrenzimmer. It's the gentleman's saloon. And our concept is following uh, the main red line. So we connect the items and the contents that are presented in the showcases that were designed extra for the new presentation and exhibition about work and life of Freud by Hermann Czech and Gerhard Flora. And here is the center of dreams, so we can call it. It's Freud's former sleeping room. And what is really interesting, that we found a film still where we can see how Freud's former uh, sleeping room looked like. And in this center of this very private space, um, we present the interpretation of dreams, the founding document of psychoanalysis. Now we are in the very intimate space of the former bathroom and dressing room of the Freud family. And so we have, for the very first time, the chance also to speak and tell about the fates of the family members. So what you see here is the chronology of uh, the Freud family and their biographies with wonderful original photographs that were collected by Anna Freud in their family album. So here we are in the kitchen of the private apartment and we removed the kitchen to implement a new staircase and this new staircase gives us now the possibility to present a very important aspect that is inscribed into the history of the house too. After Freud uh, left Vienna, the Nazis changed the function of the apartments 
and they erected so-called collection apartments. Approximately 80 Jews were prisoned here to wait for their deportation into concentration camps. Here we are in the wardrobe of Freud's practice. And as you can see, it's a very original interior, one of the very few that remained. And there was a very young photographer in May 1938, and he was asked to take photographs from Freud's uh, practice and also private apartment. And that's why we know that this is the very original interior that Freud designed and renovated when he moved from the upper ground floor to the mezzanine to open here his practice. The following room is the very famous waiting room. But not only Freud's patients uh, were sitting here waiting for the next session. It was also the meeting point of the so-called Psychological Wednesday Society. That means that the, in this furniture, on these seats, on this couch, that was given to the museum by Anna Freud, Freud's youngest daughter, so that one room gave you and all the visitors of the museum uh, impression how it looked like before. So what is very important for the new concept is that you see texts on the white part of the wall because the room, the house itself, the origin of psychoanalysis is the exhibit. And therefore there are texts on the walls that tell you about the former function and meaning of the room. So here we are on the space, on the spot, where the very important psychoanalytic couch stood in former times. And as you might know, Freud was lucky enough to take all his belongings with him when he was forced to go to his exile, to London. So he also took this icon of psychoanalysis, the couch, with him. And this was the spot and the place where the patients of Freud were laying, telling about their anxieties and dreams. And Freud was sitting behind them. The patients spoke in free association. So this was the spot where the patients developed together with Freud uh, the treatment of psychoanalysis, the so famous talking cure. So how to treat this very special space in a curatorial way, that was a very important question for us. And a lot of people asked me, Monica, please make something like a reenactment. Give something like a couch on this place or try to get the original couch so that we have the feeling Freud just left the room five minutes ago. But you know, that's not possible, because this way of presentation would deny the darkest days of our history. And therefore, we decided just to mark this empty space, also as a metaphor, uh, and tells us about the loss of humanity and culture through the Second World War and the Holocaust. And the only thing that remained are the holes of the nails with them Freud pinned the carpet behind his couch. As you can see also on this fragment of Edmund's photographs. So our visitors have to envision in order to see. Freud only took notes after, never during the sessions. He did so sitting at his desk, which was placed here in front of the window. Here we can see one very important original item. And it is the mirror that Anna brought back in 1971 when the museum was opened for the first time. And she put it on the handle where it was on its original space. During their first consultation, Freud's patients could look at their own reflection at the mirror 
a fitting metaphor in psychoanalysis for looking at one's inner self. This is the door to the walkthrough room, a discreet exit so patients could leave Freud's practice unnoticed. The new concept of the reopened Sigmund Freud Museum includes three permanent exhibitions and two contemporary changing exhibitions. The one is dedicated to wonderful American artist, to Robert Longer, who is famous uh, for his social political work. Longer's showroom installation coincidentally depicts a very current motif the image of a crashing wave as a menacing yet powerful visual symbol of our current individual and collective fears in times of the coronavirus crisis. For me as an art historian, it was very exciting to move away from a white cube presentation concept. So we integrated important pieces of our concept art collection into these rooms of historical significance. And it became quickly noticeable that the work started corresponding with the former meaning of the space, like this piece by Austrian artist Heimut Zubernick. And he refers to an event that Freud told in a letter to his colleague and friend, Wilhelm Fleece. And he wrote to him, do you suppose that someday a marble tablet will be placed on the house inscribed with these words. In this house on July 24th, 1895, the secret of dreams was revealed to Dr. Sigmund Freud. The function of the dreams is wish fulfillment. So this was a really crucial point in the development of Freud's interpretation of dreams. What is really amazing is that the couch, Liège, by Franz West is placed in the former treatment room here where Freud welcomed his so-called hysteria patients. And of course, this metal couch made by West is something different. So a lot of visitors looking at it ask me, you know, that's not that cozy couch. We are used to have in a therapy room, of course not. But what this object is telling us, the couch is something like an instrument for psychoanalysis, for instance. And also the other works start to have a shift in their meaning a little bit because of the spatial context they are presented in. So here we are in Freud's study, where he was sitting on his writing desk, writing the interpretation of dreams. And we thought it is a really good idea to put the installation by Ilya Kabakov exactly on this place. This wonderful piece titled The Man Who Flew Into His Picture is about the artist getting absorbed into this bright, empty canvas a metaphor for the artist's search for truth and new insights into art and the human psyche. So here we are in the kitchen of Freud's practice and I thought it is a good place to put here Avido, a wonderful piece by Pierpaolo Calzolari, who is such a sensitive and wonderful artist because he's dealing and working with this very daily material, how he is connecting the materials with each other, and it's about the state of the material. And this light uh, that brightens this kitchen, where not Freud himself, but his women, so to speak, was cooking for him and doing everything, serving him. And so this avido is about gender conflict, it's about sexual, um, perversions too, and therefore also a topic that is such important for our psyche development and negotiated in art as well as in Freud's psychoanalysis. Hi. 
Welcome. Hi. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our live panel discussion of Vienna's showcase at the Sigmund Freud Museum. We're currently sitting here in the Library of Psychoanalysis in the Sigmund Freud Museum, which happens to be the largest library of its kind in Europe. Uh, I want to thank you, all you viewers, and I, of course, want to thank you panelists for being with us today as we take part in this extremely necessary exchange. My name is Adia Trischler, and today we're going to be discussing the intersections of art, analysis, and public health. The, the physician and neurologist Sigmund Freud attributed significant value to the arts and its representation of psychological conditions. In recent decades, his observations and th in theories concerning this have been confirmed by contemporary medical and psychological research. Similarly, the study of psychoanalytical states and changes provide a relevant starting point for current artistic debate, which is why we're here today. Both the approaches of psychoanalysis and art focus on the individual as well as the collective experience of existence, and through that work to reveal, interpret, and oftentimes rehabilitate the original cause and effect. Now, I'm going to take a minute and introduce you to today's panelists. We have Monica Pesler, who's the director of the Sigmund Freud Museum, whom you've already just met as she gave you a tour of the museum. We also have Marcus Schinwald, a Vienna-based visual artist who, through his work with performance, film, painting, sculpture, and installation, explores the dimensions of psychological constitutions in object-related productions. And last, but certainly not least, even though you're next to me, <laughs> we have university professor Dr. Stefan Döring, who's a psychoanalyst, psychiatrist, as well as the head of U the University Clinic for Psychoanalysis and Psychotherapy at the Medical University of Vienna. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you. Um, I just have a few things to add before we get started with the discussion today. So everybody, which is exciting, will have a chance to ask questions, leave any comments during our discussion today, during the talk via YouTube chat or email at showcase at Vienna dot info. Um, don't be shy, comment, say what you need to. At the end of the discussion, depending on how much time we have left, we're going to take some time and answer some of your questions. So make sure you stick around for that. And like I said, don't be shy, ask away. Also, it's really important that I reassure all of our viewers today that all of the participants here, as well as the crew, as well as the crew have been recently tested for COVID, which is why you can see us all here like this today without masks. So I just want to let you know that we're staying safe and I hope you guys are all staying safe out there as well. All right, let's get it started, yeah? So I'm gonna start my first question with Monica. As we've just seen, the museum has so many layers and it's so complex. And I want to ask you, what actually was your entire concept behind the reorganization and ultimately the recuration of the Sigmund Freud Museum? Um, yeah, maybe it's not so easy to uh, bring that in a very short, only some sentences. But I think the different layers of our institutions, the history and also the location as the origin of psychoanalysis, has a lot of layers. And our main interest was to open the house and to show all these different layers. So we, uh, it was possible to expand the exhibition pace and to double it from 280 square meters to four, more than 400 to uh, 500 square meters. And um, this uh, different levels, like uh, the most important concepts uh, of psychoanalysis are shown. Freud, as the father of psychoanalysis, is shown as scientist as well as a private person as father and brother. And we have space in the second new staircase to um, focus on the history uh, of the house and its inhabitants. Because here in this house also Jews were uh, forced to live in so-called collecting camps before they uh, were deported to concentration camps. So this different layers sharpens the profile of the institution and a very important part, of course, is uh, the arts. So it's no coincidence that we own a concept art, concept, uh, concept art collection. And we show that 
for the very first ter- uh, time permanently. Uh, in the very first practice, uh, Freud uh, opened up in 1896 and worked there t- till 1908. And we can see how the artworks uh, enrich and explain also the concepts of psychoanalysis. Mm. So in that sense, it's it's more than even just the space. It's him kind of also peeling back the layers of the person, how I lived. I guess I'm going to uh, address my next question to Marcus. Um, is there is there anything, I don't know you very well, and I'm assuming that there's probably many things, but if there are, what are those ideas and, and concepts that you would say fascinate you as an artist about psychoanalysis? I would probably not say it fascinates me, but there's certainly an aspect of psychoanalysis uh, that is is crucial to my work and and uh, occupies me a lot. Uh, it might sound a bit naive, but but probably what brought me to art was simply a concern about people and the world, uh, the, the world around us. Um, so one could address these issues in socio-political terms, but I thought my approach is rather individual and even though it might resonate on a, on a larger, larger scale, um, uh, it was in principle personal and introverted. Um, Freud, uh, and not just Freud, but like a couple of others, Otto Rank, for example, he, their concept, like um, the uncanny, the, the prosthetic god, um, the feeling of uneasiness was quite crucial. Other texts, um, like the interpretation of dreams that was so important for many other texts, didn't do much for me, actually. Okay, interesting. But how do you then, I mean, how do you process, not the parts that fascinate you, but how do you process this, do you find that you process this interest in people through your work, actually, physically? How? So, in the 90s, I originally started with uh, manipulating and altering clothes. Um, okay. Um, I was less interested in the, in the kind of fashion aspect, but what interested me was uh, what happens to a piece of clothing if it's like a piece of shirt that is too, too short, too tight, um, when heels get too, too high. Um, so when, when an object, a piece of clothing is not just a passive object, yeah. but gets a very different dynamic. Um, I later changed that concept a little bit and, and, and shifted towards the idea of, of a prosthesis. Um, um, so a prosthesis as, as an instrument that is um, like usually an additive to to certain de- deficit. Um, nowadays we have a lot of prostheses that are even performance enhancing. So yeah. think about Oscar Pistorius and the debate about uh, uh, could he be on the Olympic team with a prosthesis? They, uh, there was a big debate if he's like uh, overpowering the rest of them. But my prostheses are not doing all this stuff. They're not, they're not overpowering. It's not about um, getting advantage uh, in, in, in relation to others, uh, but they serve a very different function. Um, they, less than like filling a void, they, they rather create it. Uh, they're objects that extend the body um, they give shape when you're about to lose them, and they are kind of objects of and prosthesis for desire. Okay. That's actually really interesting. This idea of like it's they're fill, instead of filling this void, it's like they give presence or a voice to even something that needed to be there. I, yeah, I, I'm actually wondering how when you when you chef and view Marcus's work, is there anything that you actually see? in his approach, in the visual language of what he does, that also rings true to you as a clinical psychoanalyst? Are there any of the same forms or same ways of relating that you find? Absolutely, yes. I would say, Marcus, we, we just heard it from himself, is a psychoanalyst among the, the artists. 
Um, what really struck me when I first saw his prosthesis paintings was um, how close it was to, to what we are doing in our work. So he chooses these paintings with a long history in advance. He restores them carefully. And then he thinks of a, a very individual application that he adds to these faces on these paintings. I think the audience has already seen it yeah. until now. Um, and he calls them prothesis. And um, as you, you said before, it is not an apparatus for desire, but, uh, or it's more an apparatus for desire, but not an instrument of torture. And this immediately reminded me of a quote of Freud when he was talking about psychoanalysis and the aim of psychoanalysis. He once wrote that um, our aim is to restore the patient's ability to lead an active life and uh, to increase his capacity for enjoyment. So this really is very close um, to a mental prosthesis as an apparatus for desire. I would say. I will later, I would like to know more about your idea of the desire. <laughs> but first, let me add a second aspect mm -hmm. um, where I feel there is a connection between Marcus Art and our work. Um, we understand a neurotic symptom as um, compromise formation, as a solution of a conflict or as a reduction of anxiety at the price of the sacrifice of certain freedom to live and to experience okay. ourselves, So the neurotic symptom, anxiety, depression, um, obsessive compulsive symptoms can be um, regarded as something similar to Marcos' prosthesis. They serve the purpose of restoring the stability of a person. So thus I would say your prosthesis are a metaphor of our psycho and the cure. And now I would really be curious to know what you um, think about desire, what's your desire when you apply these individual prostheses, these apparatuses of desire to the people with a long history in the paintings? Well, first of all, I, um, in a way I have as much, I think I have as much distance to my work and my personal desire than, and, than you as uh, coming from analysis uh, to my work. So it's an expression of my interest rather than an expression that couldn't go out um, otherwise. Um, I would answer your question about desire with another metaphor. Uh, so kind of the back way out of psychoanalysis um, because um, I'm, I'm very interested in it, but I'm, I'm, I'm still lacking a lot, I think. Uh, my notion of desire is, uh, I see it in, in kind of a, in a, in a spatial context. So that for me, desire is a feeling of distance. Um, distance as, so desire as a feeling of a space where you should be, you want to be, maybe the, the, the feeling of a space where other people are and that's why you should be there. And so these prostheses are thought of like instruments that kind of shorten this distance or, or build a bridge to there. Well, can I interrupt real quickly? What is it, if we, if we kind of look at even what, when we're talking about art and analysis and also psychotherapy or psychoanalysis, what, what is it that is central about the idea of desire and also central about what needs to be healed? This is what I think is, I mean, it's interesting when we talk about right now and we're talking about public health. What and at what point do you look at what you do, for instance, as an artist, even if it's not serving the public, but obviously you're through this, you're looking at you're looking at your work as, OK, you're shortening, like you said, the desire or the distance where in, in that sense, it's cure, not, not curing, but it's helping an individual in that sense. Mm -hmm. And even if that individual is a fictional person through your work, it's still helping them reach that. What would you say? What is really important to you about desire? How does looking at desire, maybe treating these desires that we have or the things that we want, also how do we apply that to social and public health on a larger scale? 
I would like firstly to respond to what you just mm -hmm. said, Marcus. I like that idea of desire as a longing for something that's not close enough to me to already have it. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a feeling that was evoked by your paintings in me, not maybe by all of them, but by some of them, that uh, like uh, a clothing mm -hmm. that hides something, increases the desire much above uh, you would have it when you would see the person naked. Mm -hmm. And these um, applications uh, on the faces, in some cases made me feel, oh, well, I would like to know more about this face, about this person. I would look like to look under the mask. Mm -hmm. I would like to find out what this prosthesis would do to the face. I remember you once were talking about uh, an artist that actually received a smiling bend, or what was no, it? No, that was actually that was a friend of mine, a Russian dancer, and he exactly. he completely incarnated this this like kind of an Eastern European cliche of of the sad clown, of the tragic figure, of the tragic hero. And so what I did is I built him a very simple chain with two hooks and he put it on and from that moment he smiled. So he was able, or the prosthesis was able to like take on the, the need to smile. It's like you delegate something to an object. Wonderful. Yes, I like that idea. So, but to answer your question, um, in a way we could also see psychoanalysis as uh, supporting a patient, a person, uh, in his or her desire. Because of, if I'm suffering from a condition, uh, from a mental illness, of course there's a desire to be recovered. There's a desire to have a healthy life, to have this capacity uh, of enjoyment, to have an active life, like Freud put it. So we are also dealing with this desire. Of course, there are many different ideas of desire too, but, but right now I think there is a moment of, of correspondence between our works. And I guess in that idea of dealing with those desires and, the, and dealing with an individual's need for certain desires to be met, then we, we hope that we can create healthier people, which can then create a healthier society somehow. Maybe, right? Is this my, my armchair philosophy of the armchair? <laughs> It's not only the armchair philosophy, I think it was uh, also the reason why Freud found so many similarities between arts and uh, psychoanalysis. So, and what is interesting, uh, you two said, is that on one hand the prosthesis uh, makes the lack of something clear and obvious, and it reminds me on the procedure in psychoanalysis that you bring the people, the individual as well as the collective, to bring to a point where it's possible to look at one's inner self and to look for the truth and to look where are my or our prosthesis. And there are two aspects. Sometimes the prosthesis is there because you really need it. But sometimes it's some um, state-of-the-art <laughs> prosthesis, something that is a chimera, that is um, imagination or a trend. And you have to ask if that is necessary or not. So it's the way and the approach that the arts, Freud thought that, make it up like psychoanalysis mm -hmm. and make a possibility, open a way to look at one's inner self, to, in a further step, work on a concept, an idea of a better approach, of a variable life, mm -hmm. um, a good contribution to the future of our society. Yeah. I mean, in that sense, actually, Monica, I'm going to ask you a question really quickly. In, in in creating or in reorganizing this museum in such a way where you really look at Freud as an individual, but then you also look at the contemporary manifestations of his work and how that's manifested, what do you think, what is, do you feel any responsibility or a socio-political even responsibility for this museum to have as, as not only the working place of Freud, but what a museum can actually be? Yeah, and that is a very good question and it's very, um, I love it because it, I can tell 
um, that it's so such a wide range of tasks a museum in our days has to uh, offer and to uh, to do. And um, first, we have, especially in this house where the talking cure was invented and developed we have to open beside the activation of the historical to bring it in the current discourse, we also have to open up talking rooms, rooms for uh, speaking with each other. And we are a platform, like today in a way, where we bring different uh, disciplines together to uh, gain a broad as possible spectrum and what is interesting is that no um, discipline and no expertise can be replaced by the other. Uh, we have to open a field where they coexist uh, with each other and cooperate with each other to form um, a base to make uh, and find good decisions. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds a little bit simple. But it's a holistic, yeah. But um, on the other hand, I made the experience since more than 25 years as an art worker that we all, since the turn of the last century, we are speaking about interdisciplinary uh, exchange and working, but it is really very seldom done. Yeah. And it's in the nature of psychoanalysis that a colleague of mine is calling a networking discipline uh, that especially at Berggasse 19, at the Freud Museum, uh, it is used to uh, bring different uh, uh, perspectives together. It's really interesting because the thing that I hear from each of you in your work is, is a really uh, a fine tuning of a dealing with the individual and, and looking at an individual and not only their place in a larger spectrum and what they do and maybe these things that they represent to the outside world, but these things within themselves, these desires, the complexities of each individual and how that relates to society. And it's interesting when I'm looking at the museum now because that's, you're restoring a sort of humanity to a myth, a person who's become a myth, you know? And, and it's so easy to not think about Sigmund Freud as a person with a family who walked up these stairs and that doorbell, you know, that also suffered from his own neuroses at certain times. But it, it is, like you said, when we talk about interdisciplinary, it's about bringing all of these things together, whether it is the arts, whether it is psychoanalysis, and also the idea of what a museum can be. It isn't this thing that you have to have distance from the artist. You don't have to have distance from the person who the space is there to represent, but to realize that every person is a, an amalgamation of a, a lot of different fields and thoughts and feelings and desires, whether they're necessary or not, but a recognition of that, actually. So um, the, the artist who founded our, or initiated our contemporary, as a, our contemporary art collection, Joseph Kashut, once said, uh, one uh, parallel uh, issue of psychoanalysis and the arts are, is that both of them create meaning. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very important aspect, this creating of meaning, because that's something, also from a humanistic point, yeah. uh, that all our societies really, uh, it's an absolute need for them. Yeah. It's this void that you don't know what it is. It, my father used to say you wouldn't know how sweet sugar was if you didn't have salt. You, don't, you, know, you don't know what love is until it's gone. It's what is that desire that most people can't name. I have to actually wrap this up so that we do have time to answer some questions and stuff from the audience as well. But thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for having this conversation with me. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this conversation. And that concludes our discussion today. Thank you so much again for joining us for this edition of Vienna Showcase at the Sigmund Freud Museum. And I guess that then it'll be nice once we have the, the conversations with the audience to kind of see actually what parts of this that they pick up and mm -hmm. they apply to themselves.
So now we get to open up for some questions from the viewers. We have time for about three questions, which I know isn't a lot, but I'm still happy that we have that time. Our first question comes from Carla from New York, who's an independent consultant. She actually has two questions. Would Freud be a feminist today? This is a, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to looking at you, Monica, because maybe they don't want to answer that. Um, that's a good question, and it's not the first time we are asked this. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a pity that Judith Butler is not here, uh, so she would um, be better in explaining that. I think, yes, he would be, because also in his time, he oriented his and changed his mind because of the interven female intervention of his patients mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. He was one of the men, and it was an exception in his time, who was able to learn from women. And I think he would be. Yeah. Also, because he did have a lot of women around him, and he trusted the women around him. Yeah, he trusted them. Sure. Which doesn't necessarily mean. He but was a patriarch, but... Uh, still, yeah. I mean, that doesn't... Yeah, one doesn't mean the other. Well, we have another question from Carla, because that was a great one. Um, do you feel like, are you able to honor history and culture and also point out that there are Freud's views that are long outdated? How do you balance that? That's a good question, actually. Should I repeat it for you again, or how... Listen. Yeah. Well... I think it's important to state that psychoanalysis uh, doesn't stop with Freud's work. Mm -hmm. And there's a continuation until today. Yeah. So like in every kind of science, not everything holds true 100 years later. So there is a development. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really think there are some things we would say that's completely bullshit or that's absolutely wrong, but we would see some things different mm -hmm. today. And if it comes to feminis feminism, of course, uh, we have different views today, and I also agree that Freud would definitely be critical enough with his, himself and his views on uh, gender issues that he would probably change his mind, maybe reluctantly, but I guess he, he would. Yeah, he's an adaptable person, yeah. Our next question is for Professor Döring. Um, what efforts do you believe must be made by society to strengthen the positive effect of art on public health? And where do you see as the concrete starting points? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure that's for me? It definitely <laughs> is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <it's> like, <laughs> so let me explain the world in two sentences. So, yeah, so exactly. I, I, so I, we'll, we'll start with the first one. Yeah, exactly. Of course, I can't really answer that, but I can maybe contribute what psychoanalysis could do. And I think psychoanalysis does not just serve the individual, but there are many concepts we do have to understand societal processes, group processes, uh, nationwide processes. And we can understand that, for example, right now in the crisis, in the COVID-19 crisis, there is a group, quite a large group in many countries, who tend to develop these conspiracy theories, who tend to develop paranoid thoughts. And uh, if we can understand this, for example, as a displacement of biographical experience, which all these people might share, uh, might share, and if we then can uh, observe how our politician, politicians react to that, then we maybe con, uh, can support the politicians in treating this group of people in a different way. So I would not recommend our chancellor or Joe Biden, for example, to act like an authoritarian father, because I would uh, assume that the number of these people who are now so um, fighting against um, the, the public health politics um, have experiences like that. And so I would recommend to try to accept that there is a reason why these people act like they do and try to, to help them changing their mind uh, with a more liberal or tolerant attitude. Of course, there are limits yeah. that we have to set, that's clear. We have one more question, which is for all of you. Um, what do we know about Freud's opinion on the link between psychoanalysis and the arts? What is known, what seems obvious, I suppose, as well? 
Well, I can say there's one thing that I don't really buy is that, or that doesn't apply to me, is his, his, his concept of sublimation. Um, 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 often, like, um, it, it focuses too much on, like, why we do stuff. Mm -hmm. And, like, the question for artists is more how we do it, yeah. not, not the why. That's interesting. Yeah. But I think Freud was thinking about that when he mentioned that the similarities is, uh, between arts and psychoanalysis is uh, a kind of approach. Mm -hmm. So, and that is about more about the how mm -hmm. uh, than about the what. So, uh, he was fascinating, for instance, by uh, literature authors like uh, Schnitzler. Mm -hmm and uh, poetry, how they were able to explain and find uh, language metaphors for inner psyche states. So, and he, he uh, mentioned that a lot. No, and, and you uh, just yeah, have so. to look at his like apartment and his study rooms. Uh, they're full, they were full with art, so. Uh, okay, as he, a collector. Yeah. So he was, yeah. Yeah, then. Is there anything actually, uh, Stefan, that you observe about his, I mean, his relationship to art and also the link between psychoanalysis and art, or that seems quite, that, that strikes you when you look and you go through his work? Well, my feeling is that he had an indirect relationship or he discovered or found an indirect relationship between arts and psychoanalysis so that he, uh, what um, you just said, Monica, he took uh, a lot of myth and uh, knowledge and stories from, from the ancient Greeks and from writers like Schnitzler and from, from many of them. And then he, he, he created this parallel between psychoanalysis and, and archaeology. Uh -huh. So that psychoanalysis um, helps to uh, free... Um, uh, what should I say, contents or personal meaning from below the ground. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's not only about the piece he definitely found or bought for his table, mm -hmm. but there was this uh, connection via archaeology and via the um, ancient myth. Okay. That's all the time we have for questions. Actually, this conversation and that question, there's another one that I can like keep going, but it doesn't. But no, thank you. Thank you guys again. Thank you all for watching us again. And I hope everyone watching found this conversation in this evening to be as inspiring as I did. So I can't thank you enough. Make sure that you please join us for our next edition of Vienna Showcase, which will be from the Albertina Modern. And that will be airing February, 2021. Until then, stay safe. Stay healthy. As always, love from Vienna and schönen Abend.